a lot of discussion recently about you know what could be possible with location-based services and often uh, folks immediately jump to these days because it's ubiquitous uh, in GPS uh, but in fact it's interesting to understand the phone company, mobile phone companies have known where you are for a long time and perhaps we could just you know try to understand exactly how how well they can localize you based on the very fundamentals of how the GSM network has worked in the past. In general, in computer networks, we have to arrange that when, uh, if we're using a shared medium, as we call it, so radio waves is one, uh, but traditionally wired ethernet, before we had switched ethernet, when it was just shared media, uh, similar, have to make sure that two people aren't talking at the same time, uh, as you know, it's like garbage. Uh, in the case of Ethernet, uh, it was very simple. Uh, in the olden days, when you just had a single wire and people tapped into the wire, uh, you listened for a while, and if you didn't hear anyone using it, you sent a packet, and you kept listening, and if the packet was transmitted and you didn't see any corruption of the packet, you go, ooh, it probably got there. Whereas if someone else happened to listen at the same time and start transmitting at the same time, you would get what was called a collision. The, the, both, both of you would see both of your packets and it would, it would read as garbage off the line. So you'd know to back off. Um, and so uh, you would then back off randomly, try again later. Uh, and there's a whole protocol there, media access control it's called. We do very similar things in Wi-Fi. Uh, uh, people try to transmit and in fact the Wi-Fi base station uh, will send a response saying I got you or I didn't. The reason that we don't quite do the same thing as Ethernet there is that um, you have what's called the hidden station problem is that we mo my mobile device and your mobile device may be able to see the base station, but we can't see each other. So we can't see that we've broadcast at the same time. Well, and all this is happening very quickly, presumably. Very quickly, yeah. yeah. So it's easy for us mm -hmm. to think in human terms about hanging around and waiting for a minute. In the case of the Ethernet, it was you would try and then uh, if it didn't get through, microseconds later, you would randomly try again, you're either, and then you'd either pause for a random amount of time or not, and whoever got in first would get in, the other one get in immediately afterwards. And you know, all sorts of interesting properties proved about uh, how that stabilizes even at very high numbers of users. So, Wi Fi site different. The mobile phone network. So, well, the first thing is reasonably obvious the mobile phone network needs to know that you're near a base station. So, here's our base station. Uh, radiating radio waves. When we send our data, which can be either the voice communication or whatever, it doesn't really matter, but it's the raw channel, the radio channel that carries this. Essentially, as far as the base station is concerned, it chops up time into little time windows. Uh, it allocates one of these time slots to a particular mobile phone. So here's mobile phone A, here's mobile phone B. And say so A gets this one, and B gets this one. In order for this to work, when A and B transmit, they have to arrange that when their packets arrive at the base station, that they arrive this one in this time slot and this one in this time slot. And they could be different distances away. And so they have to decide when to transmit so that they arrive at the transmitter at the right time. And the further away you are, you have to, in a sense, advance your communication in order that it lands at the right time. You don't wait until your slot comes up and then try to transmit it. You have to transmit it in advance. And that means that you have to know the distance between the mobile and the cell tower. And so the first thing is we can say that if there's a cell tower here, the phone company knows you're somewhere within a band or an annulus around the cell tower. So they know you are three miles from the cell tower. It's actually the way in which this protocol works is one of the reasons GSM was specified to be able to deal with a mobile moving at a certain speed. And that's to do with the rate at which you can, they do this calculation about how far you're away. And if you move too quickly, you will find that you're, 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 you're transmitting either too late or too early, depending whether you're going away from the cell tower or coming to it. So on a high-speed train, sometimes GSM didn't work. And of course, over the years, given that things are moving faster, um, uh, you know, we've just had to make these protocols a bit smarter as well. There's one other thing that they often do. In very high density areas, for example in cities, we'll often build a cell tower, so we're looking down on a cell tower, which has multiple antennas. I'm sure people have seen these on buildings and wondered what they were. These are called sectorized antennas. 
where what they do is they cover a sector. And so you can get much denser coverage from a single tower. You can get a whole bunch more sectors, and each sector can support a certain number of mobile phones. So instead of just supporting, say, a thousand mobile phones within a 10 mile radius, you can get six sectors with a thousand phones each. And very often in cities, you'll see these sectorized antennas on top, which of course now means, given the protocol and the sectorization, you've now isolated someone to be within this zone. They're not just three miles away, they're three miles away and they're within this 60 degree radius. At this point, if you were then to take this information and say a map, and you were to look and say, well, what are the feasible places this person could be? Um, and given that we have some estimate of the speed they're moving, I mean, this has been the basis, for example, for monitoring traffic on roads, because if you see a mobile phone moving at 70 miles an hour in between, between the two samples, you sort of go, hmm, 70 miles an hour, and the two arcs of the sector cross a motorway, the chances are they were on the motorway. And so that's been used by a number of companies to actually do uh, monitoring of the speeds on the roads remotely from the uh, data that's understood by the phone network. Um, and, uh, you know, if you suddenly see all those phones, uh, the other thing is, of course, they're all, there's a whole bunch of them going, given how many phones are switched on in, mo in cars these days. Uh, if you suddenly see them all going at 50 miles an hour, then you might indicate that as congestion. So it's been used as a measure of congestion. The other thing, I, mean, I said maps, one thing is we can, uh, yes, we can map this onto roads um, and have um, a guess about things and use it for things like traffic congestion. Um, but other things are, if, uh, if it's a criminal who's being tracked, then you might be expecting they're up to certain nefarious things. And if you just lay a map down on this, if a policeman lays out a map on this and looks at it, they might go, huh, I think they're there. So for example, if it was, an, if it was mostly barren wasteland or fields with one farmhouse or something, you've probably identified where that person is. Now, of course, phone companies are very protective of this information because you know, if, it was, if, if this was just to be publicly available, it would be a disaster. It would be a security and privacy disaster. Uh, uh, you know, Given that everyone carries phones, I'm sure there are people who would love to track politicians and carry a box of eggs with them and see if they could intercept them at various places. So the sensitivity around this has been enormous. But it is slightly frustrating in that in all this time, uh, we never got services uh, that would actually tell us as the user of the device where we were and give us, give us privacy-preserving um, services, um, even if it's uh, information that's, 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 that many companies make money out of. The cell phone companies will sell to a shopping centre, a shopping mall in America. Um, uh, they will sell where the people going to the shopping mall have come from, because they can track them as they travel from their home to, um, uh, to the shopping mall, see that they're there for a couple of hours. So they can actually tell you, you know, the people who come in. It's a sample, of course. It's not, a, it's not telling you about everyone, but um, uh, it's at least a sample of where people come from, so you might be able to tell that this advertising campaign and this town had a success because between this weekend and the next weekend. So those are the sorts of data services that are that are that don't share personal information but do share statistical information from that's derived from your location. We map those then to books like so um, Beowulf or. Gulliver's Travels, or all of these great classics that we all feel we should have read, we all have purchased and they lie somewhere on our shelves and um, because we got to, through the first two pages and thought, this is hard work. Delete all your files, you run this algorithm to rewrite all the file contents and erase them, and lo and behold, all the contents are still there.